Hi there, this is the companion video to the shorter Killer Hearts 2.0 update video that I posted. This is gonna be a lot less scripted, just kind of me going over the new features. I assume that you've watched that video if you're watching this one, so if you haven't, go watch that one because I'm not going to be going over all of the new features, just the things that I think are most important to talk about. So, Killer Hearts 2.0 what's the deal here? The 2.0 update is basically the modulation overhaul. There's a couple of other things that I talked about in the earlier video that are also added. For example, the DC filter toggle on the distortion, which we'll talk about later, as well as updates to the UI and the update to Snap Heap, which gives it seven lanes as opposed to just four. Snap Heap and Multipass now have the same modulation setup as Phase Plant, so you're gonna be able to use the same workflow no matter which host you're using. To to elaborate a little bit more about the new modulation update, I have what I consider are the three most important new modules, the LFO table, the curve, and remap. The LFO table is Kilohertz's answer to the automating the wave shape of your LFO problem that Serum solved with the breakpoint automation feature. The benefit of using an LFO table is that you also get access to whatever wave tables you may have. So all of the factory wave tables that came with phase plan are available, all of your user wave tables will be available. And just like the regular wavetable, you can go in and just draw in or import your own sounds to edit them as you wish. They removed the one shot and trigger mode options in 2.0, and now they have this looping modulator and this trigger input. If I click the trigger, it re-triggers manually. I can also send it a modulator input and it will intelligently change based on whether the incoming modulator is positive or bipolar. So if I click this little equal sign, boom, this changes to a unipolar modulation. If I go ahead and do the same thing with the output of the remap, it should work for a bipolar as well. If you want to adjust the threshold for the modulator input for the re-trigger, you can do that here. If you want to change the re-triggering options, it's down here at the note trigger. It starts automatic, which just changes based on whether or not you have the poly effects mode up here turned on, or if you're sending it certain other modulators. You can also set it to always re-trigger from new notes, to never re-trigger from new notes, or to re-trigger at the first of a group of overlapping notes, hence legato. So all the time-based modulators now have the same looping options as the sampler. You can set it to off, which is just one shot, infinite, which goes from the start of the loop brace or the start of the LFO to the end, sustain, which is going to do that same thing, but after you let go of the key or after you stop setting a note input, it's going to play through from wherever it's at in the loop to the end and then continue on to either stop at the end of the waveform for the LFOs or continue through the rest of the curve for the curve modulator. Ping pong goes forwards once and then back and continues that that back and forth motion, and then reverse plays through from the start of the loop to the end, and then plays backwards until it stops receiving input. The curve modulator is kind of like an MSEG, a multi-segment envelope generator. It's the new alternative to the envelope, where if you want to have something that has a very precise timing, or if you want something that's going to be synced to the beat grid, you can now do that with the curve modulator rather than using the envelope. That's also why the curve is available as a generator output module rather than just down in the modulator section. If you have one of the loop modes enabled, you can actually confine the range of that loop brace to some part of the waveform, and you can actually modulate those points directly so that if you want to expand or contract or shift in equal amounts, the two sides of the loop brace, you can have a lot of fun with evolving modulations. One important thing to note is that as you change through the preset tables for the curves, it will actually load whatever the timing and looping options are for that. So if I set this to ADSL, are, we get the same looping option, but if I change it to fish, it's going to be a one-shot mode. If you want to keep the timing and or the looping options, you just click the lock icon right here and it will stick to whatever you have set up. The remap modulator is probably familiar to anyone who's used Vital. It's a really cool way of altering the modulation that you have going out to a lot of different destinations. There is also a secondary smaller remap if you do just a regular modulation. You can go to the right click menu or the alternate click menu and then you have this little linear slope right here which you can change to be more exponential or more logarithmic, whatever you need. You can also see down here the new automation slot menu that I mentioned in the smaller video. This is probably more automation slots than most people would ever need, but even if you use 
all eight macro knobs, even if you use the modulation wheel, even if you use all 64 automation knobs and you still find yourself needing more, you can use the MIDI CC modulator. Primarily, it's there for using external controllers. I can just click on this box that says none, move a knob on my MIDI controller, and you can see that I'm manually controlling the value here. You can also just assign it to any given MIDI CC from zero to 127. Some of these are going to be predefined, like mod wheel is predefined as one, and I believe channel pressure is defined as two. If you go into the MIDI editor of your DAW, you can actually see all of the predefined positions for the MIDI CC values. Some of these will be the same inside of phase plant, some won't be, but you have all of these undefined macros that are completely open. And that means you have like 110, 105 or so, like over a hundred different MIDI CC controllers you're never gonna be running out of macros. MPE support is now built into phase plan. Depending upon your DAW, you might have to right click or alternate click, go into some context menu and enable the MPE control, but it's working really well. Pressure works for both non-MPE and MPE. MPE timbre is going to control something that depending upon your DAW might be named timbre, or in the case of Ableton, it's called slide. And the per note pitch bend will just work automatically. The new sample and hold is pretty cool because it works for any signal input. It's not just white noise that's being sampled every time you re-trigger it. So I could take this random modulator and assign it. I know I have a random value that I can get whenever I click the re-trigger button, but I can also take this LFO and assign it. And now I have something that's a little bit more deterministic. It's semi-random based on when I re-trigger versus when the LFO is happening. It could just be some sort of constantly re-triggered input. I can change it from a unipolar to a bipolar modulation if I want to, and the sample and hold will keep track of that pretty easily. The sample and hold is set to re-trigger on every note, just like any other re-triggering option, but if you want to create some sort of randomized gate, you can set the re-triggering option to off and then send it some sort of gate signal, something like the LFO or something like the LFO table has a lot of options for you to choose from. Like I said in the shorter video, groups are now available for effects and modulators. You can rename them, you can move them around, you can minimize them. It is a really useful workflow tool and it's going to make those larger patches a lot easier to manage. And when you're building up certain effects chains, you can try reordering them a lot easier. So I want to talk a little bit about the DC filter toggle that's been added to the distortion and why this decision was made. If I play a sine wave, we can see that the waveform is not really changing at all. If I take this DC filter and turn it on while I distort the sine wave, two things happen. One, we can see that the sine wave is now going over zero dB. Usually we expect a distortion unit to have some sort of built-in limiter or basically just stop anything from going over zero dB. If I add a limiter so that the sound doesn't go over zero, we can now see the other problem. we start to get this slant in the oscillation of the sine wave. If I turn off the DC filter, it sounds pretty much the same, but we're no longer going over zero and we don't have that slanted line. We get a flat one. What's happening here is that the DC filter is applying a high pass somewhere around 20 Hertz, which is right where human hearing falls off. That is useful for any sort of distortion that introduces DC offset, especially if you're playing around with this bias knob. You can see pretty quickly that the waveform starts to bend upwards and downwards without the DC filter on. So it does have use, but if you wanna do something like soft clipping where you just have a distortion at the end of your signal chain to keep anything from going over zero dB, that's not going to work for you. And for any more harmonically rich waveform like the triangle, the square, the saw, or really any wave that you build inside of a wavetable synth, it's really gonna change how the wave shape looks and sounds. This is gonna be even more obvious if I play it down in the bass octave.
keep in mind, this is with no distortion applied. The filter is really just rotating the phase of those lowest harmonics. And it's gonna really push the waveform into something that might cause problems once you have more stuff after it in the signal chain. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, I hope you found this information useful. If you have any questions or comments about the new update, I'll be in the comments below answering questions. Thanks so much to my Patreon supporters. If you want to join them on this list and get access to additional information, videos that I can't post on YouTube, subscriber only sample packs, stuff like that. There's a link in the description below. If you found this information useful, I would appreciate a like on the video. You could consider subscribing to the channel, hitting the bell to get notified when I upload new videos. Um, that should really be it. So thanks again and have a great day.